Uh, welcome to this episode of the Unwound podcast. If you followed these podcasts, you might note that the name has changed. Uh, Unwound is the name of what has been the other podcast, the one which features luthiers, guitar makers. They speak about their art and craft, but it became too complicated to run two podcasts at once. And since all of the episodes include material related in some way to the guitar, it's all now going to be under the Unwound title. Anyway, for this episode of the rebranded podcast of Unwound, I'm delighted to be joined by Daniela Rossi, who recently released a really wonderful recording of the music of Rigondi. She's going to tell us a bit about Rigondi, a bit about the recording. I'm hoping that we're going to learn a lot. But uh, firstly, I just want to say welcome, Daniela. It's uh, lovely to to have you have you join uh-huh. us. Thank you so much for the invite, Ian. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, especially since uh, I admire your work so much. So it's, I'm, I'm very happy to to be invited. Well, you're too kind. You made this uh, amazing recording of Rigondi. I listened to it from beginning to end without a break um, a while ago, uh, just just after it was it was released, and I loved every note. What came across was a real genuine love of the music that you were playing. Uh, a kind of consideration for every single note that you played. Every note had meaning, you know. Um, so it was, it was a wonderful listen. I warmly recommend it to everybody. Uh, but before you tell us about that, introduce yourself a little bit. A lot of listeners will know you, but some might not. And uh, I'm sure there are details that you you might want to mention that are unknown to to most. Okay. Well. Um... I am Daniela Rossi. I was born in Argentina um, almost 40 years ago. In three days is my 40th birthday. So I, I should, no, in two days, I should oh, mention that. So I'm quite excited delicious. about it. <laughs> and um, yeah, so a little bit of a mix of nationalities because I, I was born in Argentina. Uh, I got Italian and ancestors and um, I lived in England for 17 years. So I carry those three passports. Oh. Uh, Yes. Probably similar to Regondi, who had Swiss, German, and Italian descendants, but he lived in the UK as well. So it's a silly coincidence. It's not what connected me to his music, but I, I thought it would be fun to say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think you asked me before what got me into music. I guess it was my dad singing folk songs about Che Guevara and other... <laughs> really? A lot of uh, yeah, Argentinian folk songs uh, when I... Well, Apparently, I started to sing before, like at the same time I started to speak, he would just record the four of us, the siblings. And um, at some point when I was six, I said, Dad, can you teach me a few chords? And started to play folk music on the guitar and rock and just play music by ear. And then only discovered the classical guitar quite a bit later, maybe when I was 11. And then took it very seriously, age 14, started doing national competitions. And then I came here in my early 20s. Um, and... Um, Still here. It's fascinating that um, our stories overlap so much because I started playing uh, by ear, playing rock music, playing other types of music, and uh, took up classical at the age of 11. Nice. Yeah, and then really started to take it seriously at about 14. I mean, I took okay. it seriously before, but but uh, I decided on classical over the others. At, at, wow, no, that's, at, that's at about 14. So, that's so when you started the classical... Uh, when you started playing guitar, you didn't really know much about the classical. For me, it was a completely unknown world. Yes, me too. I think the classical, maybe the Spanish guitar is something that is, in Argentina at least, is available in most homes. It's a very cheap, affordable instrument. And my dad had a few really cheap guitars. And I think I asked for an electric guitar at some point, but I, I was not. It, <laughs> I was <laughs> north. <laughs> that maybe could have changed the story because I was really much into rock. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, British bands. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, that's that's a that's a, a good conversation for another time. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so uh, obviously you know, you've you've had a a, a varied career um, up and up until now, uh, but at some point along the lines, you must have discovered the music of Rigondi. Yes, absolutely, and I have to say it was a huge surprise because. Uh, for some reason, it wasn't in the syllabus. In a, I, I studied my whole teaching and performing degree at the Bahia Blanca 
conservatoire in Argentina. I'm proud to say it's a great, uh, great institution, free, and um, obviously then I took private lessons from teachers like Eduardo Isaac or Victor Villadangos, who they are quite well known here. Oh, yeah. Uh, when I was in my teens in Buenos Aires, but uh, I don't know, I didn't know the music of Regondi. It wasn't introduced to me in Argentina. And then I came to Europe to do the, well, the, the usual path of guitar competitions. I started it a little bit later than others because I couldn't afford to come to Europe in 2008. And then that's when I started hearing Introduction and Capriccio everywhere. And I say, one day I'm going to play this guy's music. And then there is a nice story that once I was navigating through the Naxos, uh, library online and I thought I'm going to hear to guitar set of etudes and I heard John Holmkiss playing the well the, this fantastic recording in Naxos that he has uh, of the 12 uh, of the 10 etudes and um, I think he does the capriccio as well yeah he does the capriccio as well yeah. and uh, I thought oh my god I love these studies I remember number two was my favorite and then number six and I started uh, messing around. This must have been about, yeah, 2012. I started just picking two etudes, not too seriously. I didn't think I was going to do the whole set yet. And then uh, two years later, I started studying in Italy with Paolo Pegoraro and Adriano del Sal. And it was in one of these conversations. I already had maybe a set of five etudes and I told them, and, and the Capriche, oh, maybe maybe I could do the whole set and do a recording and say, yeah, that's a great idea. And we worked through the whole program and you'd be surprised to know this recording was not made now. It was made uh, seven years ago, but it took me years to release it. Uh, it was one of those things that I tried a few labels. Some of them said no, like the big ones, the biggest, uh, they say, yeah, it's wonderful. Even Sony say it's a wonderful recording, but we can't take a risk with someone who is not well known. Yeah. And um, and then I had a couple of labels that said yes, but the conditions were awful. So I left it and this year I say, okay, I have to do this. I'm going to do it self-release. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so... Um, finally it's out there but uh, it took me more or less four years on and off among other repertoires that I was doing for competitions I was still competing when I did this um, yeah. uh, so it was like taking this program together with many other things and it, it was a nice journey okay um, okay that's amazing so when you made this recording you were fully immersed in that in that repertoire yes yeah because because it actually sounds like you'd played the pieces for much longer. You know, every phrase, every note is thought through. There's nothing random in your recording. It's well, thank you. I'm glad it came across like that. I, I did work a lot on it, and um, yeah. I listened to a lot of piano music. I, I remember I was listening to Chopin, the, the Opus 10, Opus 25, uh, least transcendental studies, and because uh, that was also, uh, and, and the input from my teachers at the time was fantastic, of course. But yeah, yeah, the, the idea was that nothing was uh, mechanical. And I think this can be a danger in music from that period. I hear some people. Of course, maybe I could be a bit biased, but uh, I, I listen to people that I love how they play other styles. And then I hear uh, the romantic composers and it's very easy to either overdo this rubato or or to not do it enough and to make it sound mechanical. And this is one of the challenges of that music, I think, is how, how do you find a happy medium there? Yeah, well, you found it for sure. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I hopefully, and it's funny that seven years later, I definitely changed some things, but I'm... Um, uh, I'm happy about it. I'm surprised that I'm still happy about the recording because I'm usually I'm happy about most things I did more more than three four years ago. But that's that's how we grow, I guess. That's right. Yeah. And this one hopefully still would be something. Um, I'll be in my eighties and I'll still be kind of proud of. Hopefully. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so you mentioned before that your uh, favorite etudes initially were two and six. Uh, is that still the case now? Was it still the case when you made the recording? Um, yeah, I think it is still the case. I'd say yeah. two and six are my favourite. Six, I think, is mostly most people's favourite ones. Mm -hmm. Certainly Dusan Bogdanovich, he, he told me the first time I met him, number six is my favourite piece uh, by, by Regondi. It's very, very challenging to make it sing, but uh, it's so deep as well. Well, I think uh, this would be a good time to hear a bit of the recording. So we'll just hear 
uh, a short excerpt now uh, from Daniela's uh, Regondi recording. Uh, it's Etude number six. Now would be a good time to uh, ask you what it was that initially attracted you to his music. Well, I, th I think it, extreme lyricism, the use of the harmony he has, uh, he reminds me so much to the piano. I think he has the same depth as lots of the piano composers of that time. I found that there was nothing mechanical. It's not just thought for to for it to work on the guitar. I think he must have thought about outside of the instrument, I imagine maybe with the voice. I think the fact that he played with a, a cello pianist uh, and a pianist, he, he maybe, and he probably had a, an unusual amount of skill because he was a child prodigy as well. Um, I think it's just pure music. It's, it's, uh, you could play it on a piano and it could sound amazing as well. Melody, <laughs> harmony, the forms he uses, the, the way he treated the uh, etudes as uh, concert etudes, because yeah, you can play, they're really nice, the Giuliani, the the, mm -hmm. the costs are super good uh, etudes, uh, the, the sore, of course, I'm not going to say anything bad about them, but the, I think Regondi is another league. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think you're right that they're much more self-consciously concert etudes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You could put them on Chopin's level. For the guitar, of course. With yeah. Our limitations, our range. But you mentioned Chopin uh, a, a couple of times in this conversation. Uh, is would Chopin be the kind of nearest non-guitar contemporary of of Rigondi? Yeah, yeah. Stylistically. Yeah. But uh, where does he stand in relation to uh, to the guitar composers? 
Yeah, I think he would be one of the composers that stands out of the crowd as well because he only wrote pieces that were concert pieces. That's extremely uh, high level, everything he wrote. And uh, he, he didn't write that many pieces either, but everything is exquisite. Um, so I, I would say he... I would put him as one of the most important composers, one of one of the highest of all times in guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are kind of uh, lines of tradition or threads of tradition. Rigondi seems to be coming out of a a development, perhaps of of Saur more than he is of Giuliani. Giuliani, for sure. Yes. Yeah, just in his just in the way he approaches the guitar, uh, it'd be good to hear another piece now. Daniela, so uh, the other etude you mentioned uh, liking very much, I mean, you like all of them, but uh, a favourite is number two. So what is it about this piece that we could listen out for? Well, uh, the, it goes through so many keys. I go uh, A flat major, B major, C, uh, D major, C sharp. Let's speak maybe the, 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 the opening on the A minor with that beautiful melody. Yeah. Uh, Okay, well, uh, let's hear that now. So I now want to ask Daniela about the recording process. What was it, well, what is it that you find challenging about the recording process in general? And what was it that you found challenging in particular relation to Rigondi? Okay, well, first of all, putting that program together, which was, I think it's 67 minutes of music, that, that's already a challenge. But then thinking that the, the technical challenges of Rigondi, the stretches that you have, because it was obviously made for a much smaller instrument than the modern guitars that we play today. Uh, yeah, preparing everything, uh, the different keys that you're playing, which includes a lot of bar chords. If we talk about more technical aspects that like people would like to listen, uh, etude number two, if you are not smart in the use of your left hand and how you, how you de develop your work and and rest uh, technique that, that that could kill your left hand with the, all these keys because it, some sections are entirely of bar chords and uh, on top of that you want to keep a completely clear line that is not rigid it's not mechanical it has a rubat that is not too much not too little and um it's it's just um it's a, a lot of fun but uh, yeah obviously you have to work on the lines separately. I did several homemade recordings and yeah. listen back and say, oh, this sounds horrible. Actually, this sounds like it's, it's, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm playing as an etude, but uh, like a super mechanical. Um, then it, it, it was a lot of work. Yeah. 
as you can imagine. Uh, but then obviously you prepare everything and you've got everything more or less figured out when you go to the studio. And then you have the suggestions of amazing John Taylor as well. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is both uh, a challenge because sometimes he does very interesting artistic suggestions that you say, okay, well, I thought it this way, but slight uh, changes on the phrasing and it, you you actually can see, okay, this this can be changed. Um, so the, the recording was a lot of fun. I think it took us maybe two and a half days. Like um, we did some late evening recording. It was so long ago that I'm... Yes, you have to think to, to remember. But I, I remember uh, maybe the two of my favorite pieces. I, I play better in the evenings. I, I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. I'm more inspired. And I think a two number six and the uh, Capriccio were recording in two evenings. Okay. 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 Um, and I, yeah, you, you got all sorts of challenges such as temperature in a church. It can be mm -hmm. extremely cold, even with the heaters. Uh, planes coming where you maybe you did a really good take and it's ruined because because the, the plane and then the yeah the process of recording and the process uh, John makes it fantastic as he chooses the takes I don't have to make any decisions there I trust him completely then it comes the first and this with its second second edits um so it's it's, it's whole uh. It's a process that takes a lot of time, but mm. when when you know you're in good hands, uh, you, you're really. <laughs> yeah. Well, the two um, things I want to ask you about from uh, f from your answer, I want to ask you about John Taylor and the role of a record producer because that's something that many people might be unfamiliar with. They might just think of them purely as a purely, I suppose, more in the role of a recording engineer. You're someone who sets up microphones and the like. But you mentioned the artistic input that yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah. But just before we go there, and before I forget, something for the guitarists. You mentioned the many bar chords in, in Etude number 2 and the necessity of being smart with your left hand uh, in order to conserve energy. Yeah. Can you give us a few tricks of the trade? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I well, what well, I think you need to work or with your body um for example well you must know the alexander technique i do a lot of feldenkrais awareness through movement i suffer through some um injuries in my teens for yeah. a lack of good use and so now uh, i became super conscious of that and yeah thinking about using the gravity for your left hand rather than that, the, the, the weight of your body rather than the pressure uh, you, you're not fighting against the guitar. You need to use the gravity in your favor. And uh, yeah, everyone will have a different approach to this. But uh, do, do, how do you have independence in the different parts of the finger and you don't use the whole weight all the time? Uh, I guess doing some bar exercises. But yeah, you, you, you every time you do a gesture of work, you should compensate it with one of rest as well. It's like breathing in and out. If you don't have that balance, then then it, you won't get to the half of the etude because that, that one is a real, real challenge. Yeah, that's a good point about you know, needing to compensate at, at all times. So something that takes effort, you must then compensate. Uh, or with... more than compensate, it's like balance because yeah. even the, the movement shouldn't be an effort. It should be the right amount. Um, also, what important as well is when a movement is forced and it's jerky the music will not sing through mm -hmm. you need to you need to equal the musical um yeah the, the musical desire or the, the musical idea that you have you need to match it with a coherent body gesture and this is something that you can work a lot outside of the instrument i'd say in my case it's feldenkrais awareness through movement but then you can do a lot of other things so you can do it with tai chi um, Remember that the guitar, if, if the guitar breaks, uh, we can buy another one. It's sad, but we can replace it. But if the yeah. body doesn't work anymore. So, yeah, that this is something that I think is a lot, a lot more consciousness about this topic now. But many guitarists still think in terms of the hands and the rest of the body is like a rigid uh, figure. And, and you can tell that the, the, the people who are physically smarter in the use of the bodies. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just a question of brute strength 
It's not just yeah. a question of, no. of, of making your hands strong, then it will be okay. I mean, you do need strength. As you said, yes. some body exercises yes. are necessary. But part of the exercises, of course, will be learning how to uh, distribute the weight properly on a, a, a body so that you're, you're not wasting energy. Um, yeah, I remember a master class with David Russell. He said something that would stick forever in me. He says, he said to a person who was very strong, a big guy, and say, um, "You seem to have a lot of force. I'm, I'm sure you you you'd be wonderful, but you don't need brute force for this. You need accuracy." I think that's that's a nice. Oh nice yeah, to remember. it is. It is that. that yeah. Excellent. So uh, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, is, is was working with John Taylor. You could tell us a bit about, you've already mentioned how good he is. Um, yes. For people who are not aware, John Taylor is a very well-known and wonderful record producer, uh, for, uh, for, for, especially for, for guitar and, and recording engineer as well. He, if I'm right, uh, he combines both roles. In yes. the way he, he, I mean, he knows all about the good mic placement and mastering and all this. Okay. And all this stuff, but he is also uh, a record producer in the sense that he is not afraid to give you some artistic input. And Absolutely. you alluded to that already. And I'd like you to just explain how that works. Yeah, well, you know, you could, you're playing something and he would say, well, he, he will give you a mood maybe that he, he would suggest that you could change, or I, I can't remember exactly for the for the Regondi now because it's been a long time but now in my second recording that I did with him by uh, works by John Yard and Chris Yard was there as well so there were, there were some suggestions especially in some of the, some of the pieces that that were newer to me because it's yeah. a much longer program and that and, and I totally trust uh, this uh, some sometimes I would agree sometimes I wouldn't but uh, most of the times it was very very good input and 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 then you listen through and you hear and you compare. And although you prepare the whole program, you, you, you can also be open to change things on the spot. Yeah. It will be about phrasing for sure. Particular mood or character that you want to express or you thought you were expressing enough and you were not. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's obviously a person who recorded the best and he played as well. He was yeah. like a really fine player and uh, you, you can tell. Yeah, yeah. Some people are good at maybe using the mics, and uh, yeah, they're definitely good listeners, but they don't have this experience in in playing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, their job is to bring the the best out of you, and that exactly. sometimes means telling you when uh, it isn't the best. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And uh, so then giving you some suggestions as to how it could uh, better come across. It's it's a it's a very interesting role actually, and. Yes. Uh, a very a very important one. Uh, it'd be nice to hear another piece. Yeah. Maybe maybe one of the non etude pieces. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it makes total sense to listen to the piece that has the title of the CD. Well, let's hear two sections: some of the introduction, and then some of the uh, caprice. A wonderful work played here, exquisitely by Daniela Rossi.
So that was uh, Introduction and, and Caprice, or at least two excerpts of uh, quite a long and very challenging piece played uh, absolutely beautifully and effortlessly there by Daniela Rossi. I wanted to ask you, Daniela, about your choice of a modern guitar for this recording. It's quite different to the guitar uh, Rigondi uh, would have played. Uh, yes. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about why you chose uh, a modern guitar and uh, what the challenges are of uh, playing this music on such an instrument? Well, the, obviously the modern guitar is what I play usually. I don't own a romantic guitar. Yeah. Uh, obviously I could have uh, got, got hold of one if I if I had wanted to, but the dimensions of the modern guitar are much bigger, of course, and some of the stretches seem almost impossible. Um, especially in the Capriche, they're, they're quite quite hard and etude number two. Um, but obviously, then the the volume, the tonal variety that you can get on a modern guitar, I think it compensates all the other uh, issues that you could get. Um, so yes, I I did obviously try the etudes, and it's it's really nice to know what sound Regondi mm. would have out of it and it's such, such a sweet sound but um no I, I, I think he would have been happy with this yeah. more maybe piano or cello approach of the modern guitar especially because he played with piano and cello pianists and cellists and it's, it's just an imagine I, I think he would have liked it, the sound of the modern guitar I'm, I'm 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 sure i'm sure he would have um but it is a very different beast and it's the way that you, the way you make the sound, and the way you produce tone color, yes. is is quite different. But I think and the what technique said, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you said at the start of that answer was you know very instructive. I mean, the modern guitar is what you play. Yeah, it's yeah. the obvious. It's the kind of obvious of answer, course. and it isn't quite as simple as just picking up an old pre Torres um, yes. uh, guitar and 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 expect it to work the same way. It's, it's a very different, it works a very different way. The way Absolutely. you produce the sound has to be very different. Well, thanks again, Daniela, for joining us for this episode. It's been a, a real joy to speak to you and to hear excerpts of the recording again. As I say, I listened to it uh, a while ago in one sitting. I, I loved every bit. Uh, I really urge people to go out and buy this recording if you're a guitar enthusiast or just a music enthusiast, because this is beautiful music and it's very difficult to imagine it being played better than this. Uh, so just as you might have, um, you know, the definitive edition of the Chopin Etudes, now is the time to add to your library with uh, what we might call the definitive edition of the Rigondi Etudes and, of course, his uh, other pieces like the introduction and caprice, which we heard just now. Uh, Daniela, before we sign off, what else have you got? happening. You mentioned one other recording in the works. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I talked briefly about this recording, which was uh, took about two years of work. Uh, it's, it, it's called Homages. Uh, it's to John Duarte, and it was commissioned by his son, Chris Duarte. Uh, so they, they are homages for him by Angelo Gilardino, Dusan Bogdanovic, Mark Houghton, and then homages that he wrote to Antonio Lauro, Wes Montgomery, Django Reinhardt, Casten Tedesco, Manuel Ponce, that was written with his teacher, Terence Usher, and uh, Ida Presti. And this is released by Brilliant Classics in to, uh, early 2025 and was recorded with John Taylor as well. And then this is probably one of the biggest projects together with the John Duarte that I have in my career, which is the recording of uh, works by Dusan Bogdan, which release, uh, it will be released by Naxos. So this will be recorded in November 
also with John Taylor and Dushan will be present as well. So he will be kind of the artistic director as well. Yeah. <laughs> and this will include five pieces written for me. So they're all premiere recordings and another premiere recording piece dedicated to Eduardo Isaac, uh, a sonata. Uh, so it's, this is probably one of the most challenging things I have because playing a whole program by Dushan Bogdanovich with all these polyrhythms and counterpoint will be really crazy. But this is really the music, 19th century music, John Duarte, Dushan Bogdanovich, maybe a few other things like my Polyest programs are, is the path I found my after my, my post-competition career, let's say. Like when you say, well, you can play the standard repertoire, you can play everything kind of well, but what is my contribution to the world? I hope that when I'm really, again, in my uh, bed in my 80s or 90s, I can say, okay, I can be proud of these three things that I did at least, and hopefully many more. But that this is what I like to contribute to the, my little contribution to the world in music. Well, well, if, the, if these two other recordings are anything close to as good as the Rigondi, uh, they will be absolutely worth buying, having in your record library. Well, that's great. Anything else on on the cards? Non well, the, the, obviously, the, uh, some some more concerts. Um, there will be one in Manchester for uh, Latin American Spanish music. This will be a totally different program. So I will be doing some world premieres by some young composers in Argentina. So my idea is to start con collaborating with uh, composers that are alive as well. Yeah. That's great. Um, then obviously, well, really great collaborations that I had in the past with uh, Vincent Lindsay Clark, who wrote a fantastic set of folias for me. I, I love to record this at some point. I need to, yeah, maybe put it in the context of a, of a program that makes sense for a, for an album with Mark Houghton as well. Jeffrey McFadden, who wrote a great piece inspired in Regondi's Etudes 2 and 6 for me. Uh, when we met in Spain, so this all these things to shape them up, play them in programs, and uh, record them hopefully. But yeah, <laughs> that's great. There's a lot going on. Just lastly, um, tell us where we can find out uh, more about your work. Um, so if you go, to, it's very easy to remember DanielaRossiGuitarist.com. That's my website, and then you've got, got the access to mainly my YouTube. There is where probably the best material is. Uh, I'm trying to put good quality videos, and then well, Spotify is still very little because it's just a regondi, but Spotify is there. Yeah, and, and where can people buy um, a, a physical copy of the regondi? Well, obviously, in all the digital platforms, you can... Oh, physical copy, sorry. Yes, um, usually Bandcamp. If they go okay. on Bandcamp, Bandcamp. That's, yeah. that's the best yeah. uh, way. And, and, and of course, it's on and it's on Spotify. And, yeah, uh, and because it's self-released, I will sign it for them with a lot of love and okay. send a dedication. If they buy uh, the physical copy. Or obviously, they can come to my concerts and buy them as well. Yeah, well, the, these podcasts, I, I can't say that, uh, you know, I, here, here's, a, here's a code that you can put in and you get a, <laughs> <laughs> mention me and you get a reduction, I'm afraid. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, no, it's I'm, I'm really just, I'm just simply, yeah, I'm simply not that important. But uh, anyway, uh, very grateful, though, to have been able to speak to you about uh, Rigondi and some of your other work fascinating stuff. Uh, I will link to all of those uh, sites that Daniela mentioned uh, below to her, to her website where you can find out more about her work, her concerts, uh, her, her recordings, her YouTube, uh, and uh, of course, a link to the recording that we've been discussing. So thanks again, Daniela. Thank you so much for, the, yeah, for inviting me in and I hope I get to see you and that to listen to you in concert again after so many years and may, who knows, maybe at some point we will share a concert as well. That would be fantastic. That would be wonderful. That's something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here. Well, the pleasure was mine. Uh, uh, thank you very much for watching or listening to this uh, episode of Unwound uh, and hope you will like and subscribe and listen into the next one. All the best.